Welcome back to my beginner's playthrough of KSP2's Exploration Mode, where I show you how to master the game and unlock all the parts and discover all the secrets. In episode 1 we learned the basics of flight, from straight up, straight down, to achieving orbit and then reaching the MUN. Episode 2 we went back to the MUN, but this time performed a landing, and now here we are, on episode 3. We currently have one primary mission available, which is to land on the Mun again, but this time at a specific location, and three secondary contracts, which can actually all be very easily done with one spaceflight. Now I considered doing this in the same video as the Muna signal mission video, but to be honest, I want these videos to have a specific focus, and doing all four of these contracts in one video, I feel like would make the video's content a bit scattered. So this can be considered episode two and a half, maybe? Anyway, we're just going to do one flight to unlock the three secondary missions. What are they? Well, first up we have Escaping Kerbin, where, get this, we have to escape Kerbin's gravity and end up in interplanetary space. Exciting! Next we have Lonely Satellite, which simply asks us to launch a vessel to orbit that has a solar panel, probe core and an antenna. And finally we have It's Eccentric, which asks us to reach a Kerbin orbit with a periapsis between 70 and 150 kilometers and an apoapsis of 300 to 8400 kilometers. Track all three of these, and then head on over to the VAB. Now compared to the last rocket we built in this series, this rocket is going to be a lot more technically simple. We begin by placing the small command pod that we've used for every mission up until now, I added an extra small probe core on top just to fulfil the lonely satellite contract, I then added a small parachute at the top, heat shield on the, on the bottom, and then a decoupler followed by the science junior. With the command pod and science unit in place, it's now time to build the rocket. We're going to place a single FLT-800 fuel tank to serve as our rocket's upper stage, and then we're going to add the trusty Terrier engine to power it. Then we're going to add four solar panels in four-way symmetry so that there's always a solar panel facing the sun, and two batteries to ensure we definitely don't run out of electricity. And then we need to add an antenna, because of course we need to fulfill the lonely satellite contract, which again asked us to build a vessel that has a probe core, solar panel and antenna on board. I used the small DTS M1 antenna simply because it's the easiest to incorporate on a rocket like this. Then we can build the lower stage, stick a decoupler under the Terrier and then add three FLT-800 fuel tanks followed by the swivel engine, making sure you don't use the Reliant engine by accident, we need the swivel's ability to gimbal. We're then going to add two of the small radial decouplers, because according to our engineer's report, our thrust weight ratio is currently less than one, so this thing is not going to get off the ground, so to help it, we're going to add two solid rocket boosters to the side. Try and attach them so that they're in the center of the decouplers and therefore in line with the core stage of the rocket. I did my best and then swung the camera to look down and realized that I didn't do this very well. So I had another go. There we are, attached nicely. And then we're going to use the offset tool to shift them down as far as possible, or in other words, have the decoupler located as high as possible on the solid rocket booster. And then when they can't move anymore, we're going to offset the decouplers so that the nozzles of the side boosters are just below the nozzle of the central core engine. As you can see, I then added two nose cones to the booster and some struts to connect the bottoms of the boosters with the core stage just to ensure that this thing remains rigid during flight. I then finally added four Separatron boosters to the side boosters, two for each booster, with the nozzle of the Separatrons pointing towards the core stage, so that when those boosters detach, they're pushed away really well by those Separatron boosters to ensure they definitely don't just fall back and destroy our rocket. Now I'm going to use a part that you've not seen me use up until now, and that's the launch clamps. They attach to your rocket like so, and they work as you'd expect. They hold the rocket steady on the launch pad until you're ready to launch. You press space to fire them. They work a bit like decouplers, I guess. They are optional, but you know, they are a bit more realistic and they do keep your rocket more stable prior to uh, launching. As you can see, I've donned our rocket with an awesome paint job and now we need to sort out the rocket staging. So we can go to the staging window on the right. First things first, we're going to group all of the launch clamps into the same action group. Then we're going to ensure that the four Separatrons are in the same action group as the side decouplers. Then we're going to make sure that the two solid rocket boosters and the central core swivel engine are in the same stage. Now, ideally we want the rocket to launch so that the side boosters are to the left and to the right of the core stage, rather than above and below the core stage during the gravity turn. So we can kind of be lazy about this and just turn the rocket 90 degrees in the vehicle assembly building so that it spawns on the pad in this orientation. Also just then you might have noticed I made sure to move my launch clamp staging into the same stage as the engines. Now our current thrust to weight ratio is 1.835, which is absurd. We do not need thrust to weight ratio anywhere near that high, so we can right click the solid rocket boost 
boosters and adjust their thrust level to 50%. This gives us a much more reasonable thrust to weight ratio at launch. Speaking of the launch, uh, here we are on the launch pad in the orientation that we wanted, which is good. So let's hit space to launch. Now, you might have noticed that we actually dropped down a little bit before we started ascending, and that's because as soon as those engines light up, they're not immediately at max throttle. So it's actually probably better practice to put the launch clamps in your second stage. When your engines fire, you then press space again quickly to leave the pad and hopefully not drop down. Although it doesn't really make that much of a difference, to be honest. Now, I'm just going to highlight the fact that I didn't notice this at the time somehow, but I have a bit of a visual glitch going on with the rocket where bits of the rocket are kind of like floating away from it if that makes sense that's a that's a bug i haven't just like changed the rocket's design off camera before launch but would you look at that beautiful sunset over the clouds i mean despite the uh, small visual glitch with the rocket this is a pretty beautiful flight now hopefully at this point in the uh, playthrough you're familiar with reaching orbit so i won't talk too much about what i'm doing but to just briefly summarize i'm aiming to be pointing 45 degrees on the nav ball by the time we reach 10 kilometers and we are of course following the 90 degree vector or in other words we're burning east or in other other words with the rotation of kerbin it's generally always best practice to launch with the rotation of a planet or moon because you get a little bit of extra delta v so yeah, if you ever wondered why we all launched this way that's why anyway as you can see our solid rocket boosters are about to flame out Ready? There they go. So now we can press spacebar to stage and drop them as we continue on our way to orbit. Now, I've already talked about how to get to orbit quite a number of times in this series. So I'm going to keep this bit brief and just speed the footage up. But to summarize, I'm keeping my rocket pointing about 45 to 30 degrees until our time to apoapsis is about a minute, at which point we're going to start tipping over more towards our prograde marker so we can focus more of our energy into increasing our horizontal velocity. And wait for it. Yep, our first stage has now burned out, so we can press the spacebar to stage and fire the Terrier engine. Now, we have a huge amount of delta V in this stage, about 2.5 kilometers per second, which is a lot more than we actually need for this mission. But, you know, I just wanted to make the mission nice and simple and nice and easy and guarantee we definitely had enough fuel to do everything we want to do. Anyway, I'm watching the apoapsis readings underneath the nav ball, waiting for it to get to 75 kilometers. You don't want to have it dead on 70, which is the border of space in this game, because then you haven't got enough time to perform your circularization. So 75, I thought would be a nice clean number to aim for. Then we can just accelerate to four times physical time warp and wait for that point at which we cross the boundary of the atmosphere and enter space, which has now happened. And at some point during the ascent, I noticed that visual glitch. So I pressed F5 to make a quick save and then pressed F9 to load my most recent quick save. And let's see. Aha, it has fixed the glitch. I don't know how well you can see because we're on the night side of the planet, but I can assure you it's fixed. Now we're going to make a manoeuvre plan just before apoapsis and drag on the prograde marker until we see our apoapsis and periapsis switch sides. Now what we could do is actually go for the eccentric orbit right away. You can see you can just keep on dragging out prograde to get your apoapsis nice and high. For simplicity's sake, let's just circularize first and then worry about setting up the eccentric orbit. So make sure your periapsis is above 70. It's not quite there yet. It's in the 60s, which is too low. That's in the atmosphere. So we're just going to move the maneuver plan very slightly until there we are. So tiny bit eccentric orbit, but as long as you know the periapsis and apoapsis are both in space, I'm not too worried. With that set, we're going to press the maneuver plan button on the SAS control panel and then, well, execute the burn, which with the power of video editing, is over in a second and wait for it, boom. Now that we're in orbit, we've actually already fulfilled our first of the three contracts, which is of course the lonely satellite contract. Now this does feel a bit cheesy, right? Because clearly the intention behind this contract was that you build an autonomous unmanned satellite that just stays in orbit, but darn it, we have science to unlock. So we're just gonna do it this way instead. Now, let's just remind ourselves what we need to fulfill its eccentric. We need a periapsis between 70 and 150 kilometers, which we already have, and an apoapsis of 300 to 8,400 kilometers. So we can hit escape, click the tracking station, find our ship, right click it, press control, and then finally press the letter M on the keyboard to resume control. So as previously mentioned, our periapsis is already at the height required to fulfill the its eccentric contract, but our apoapsis is far too low. So we're gonna make a maneuver plan at our periapsis and then just drag on prograde until you get it above 300 kilometers. I decided to aim for a nice round 500 kilometers. Don't know why really just seemed like a good idea at the time, I suppose. <laughs> 
Anyway, with the burn all set up, we can just point towards the manoeuvre node vector on the navball with the SAS control panel, and then once there, we can press Z to whack this thing to full throttle and execute the burn. Now our mission contract is actually going to get fulfilled, there we go, before the burn completes because of course the manoeuvre plan is getting us to an orbit higher than required to fulfil the contract. Again, it, in the moment, it just seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> uh, but you might want to just set up 300 kilometers as your target apoapsis because that's all that's required for the contract. Either way, the contract has been fulfilled, the burn is complete. Let's press escape and select mission control to hand in our contract. There it is. We're going to click it's eccentric, click submit, and hey presto, just let Dr. Kerry come and do her spiel for a second, and there we are. Thank you, science. Now, we just have one more contract to fulfill in this mission, and that is escaping Kerbin, which is actually uh, going to be pretty easy to do. Let's just go back to the tracking station, find our vessel, and control it again. There we are, and then you can press M to uh, go back to the gameplay screen. Now we're going to create another maneuver plan to raise our apoapsis even further. In fact, we're going to raise it to the point where it completely disappears. Sort of, it, it doesn't disappear, but it falls outside of Kerbin's sphere of influence which is what we want to do to fulfill the contract. Now, we're going to make it so that we're only just leaving Kerbin's sphere of influence, because, of course, this is not an uncrewed satellite. Bill Kerman is on board, and we'd quite like Bill Kerman to get back home. Getting back home isn't actually part of the mission contract, to be honest. So you don't actually need to bring a Kerbal with you. You can just put your spacecraft on trajectory outside of Kerbin, and then once you've left, call it a day and just leave it floating around in space forever. But I wanted to bring a Kerbal, first of all, because it's quite cute having a little passenger watching us from the top of the screen there. And also, we can get some bonus science. We can run our Science Junior and perform crew observations from Kerbal orbit. Kerbal is the uh, the sun in this game. The only sun for now. Although, of course, there will be more suns in the future when interstellar travel is added. But for right now, this is the only solar system that exists. I know solar system is specific to us. I'm talking about Kerbola system, but, you know, you guys all knew what I meant. I don't know why I'm starting arguments in my head with myself again. <laughs> anyway, as you can see, our contract has been fulfilled because we have now left Kerbin's sphere of influence. So... Let's press the science tab and do some science. What? What the devils? I was a bit confused at this point because I wasn't able to run any science experiments. I couldn't run any crew observations. I couldn't run my science junior, so I thought maybe this is a bug. So I got Bill out on EVA. Right clicked him, but it says invalid research location. So I guess we can't get any science. They, they fixed it. I'm adding this bit. Like, this is really annoying, guys. Uh, like, I had the video, here it is, in my YouTube studio, all ready to, like, go live. And then KSP, this week, they released an update that patched this out. And now you can indeed get science from Kerbal. So, great, but also a bit, now I've got to, like, edit the video again and add this, like, disclaimer to it. So, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, despite the lack of scientific achievement on this mission, the show must go on. So, going over to the map screen, right-click Kerbin and press Set as Target. We're then going to press the target vector on the SAS control panel, and our ship will automatically point back towards Kerbin on the navball. Then, we can just press Z to max out our throttle and burn back home. This is not very efficient, but I deliberately added lots of extra fuel into the rocket so that we could just do this without having to worry about setting up a maneuver plan and get a proper encounter. Look at that, we're on an impact course with Kerbin and we've still got over 500 meters per second of delta V remaining. I then did some small additional puffs of the engine just to get our periapsis at Kerbin to be a little bit higher. I aimed for 20 kilometers in altitude which is low enough so that we can capture and re-enter and not pop back out of the atmosphere, but also high enough to ensure it's nice and safe, we won't overheat and explode. And now that's all done, it's just a case of, you know, waiting for us to enter Kerbin's fifth influence. We can time warp and just watching our orbital line for our spacecraft. Wait for it, there's the encounter. And now we have entered Kerbin's sphere of influence. So Bill is definitely going to get home. Now we're just going to time warp down to Kerbin itself and brace ourselves for re-entry. It's going to be the hottest and fastest re-entry we've done in this playthrough so far, so hopefully we survive okay. I'm just nursing the time warp down as we approach the atmosphere, and then right at the last moment I decided to stage, and then ensure that our capsule is pointing retrograde, so that the heat shield is going to take the brunt of re-entry and leave the crew pod 
Probe Core, remember about that, and Parachute Unscathed. I'm just going to use the power of video editing to speed this part up. And now that we're through the thermal event, we can think about deploying the parachute. We do this by staging as we've done before. I think it's a good idea to not deploy your parachutes until you've seen all of those flames, plasma effects disappear. Otherwise, you might run the risk of the parachute deploying during the thermal event and then subsequently burning up and then you're a bit uh, up the creek without a paddle, so to speak. So it looks like we're coming in for a desert landing, Soviet style, at night. Let's just uh, accelerate the footage a bit again to get to the touchdown. Here we go. Boom. And we can now recover our vessel. So we can see if we can get some research points for this location. It looks like we've already got science from the Kerbin Deserts before. So let's just press recover again. Don't press revert. Very evil of the developers to put the revert button and recover vessel button right next to each other. But yeah, just make sure you press recover. Then we can hand in our escape Kerbin mission. So was the reward worth it? How much science did we get? And what can we unlock on the tech tree? Let's head on over to R&D and find out. It's going to go to node two. And it turns out we only have enough science to unlock one node. So I guess, uh, was it worth it? I don't know. I think so. I decided to unlock atmospheric science because more science is always good. But this is atmospheric science. And our next mission is going to be going back to the Mun. And Mun has no atmosphere. And it would be a bit of a waste to bring it with us just for our curb in a sense. So I thought, let's do a little bonus launch. We'll build a small rocket just to use our newly acquired atmospheric science pieces and see if we can unlock some bonus science. Because, you know, it would be nice to get some science in this video, right? Where I play through the for science update of KSP2. So here we go. The rocket is even more basic than the rocket we launched for our very first first mission. It's literally just the small size command pod with a parachute on top and a decoupler underneath with the Flea Solid Rocket Booster. Opening the engineer's report revealed a very, very high thrust weight ratio. So I just changed the thrust limiter percentage so that we had a thrust weight ratio of about 1.2, which turned out to be exactly 20%. And with that done, we need to, of course, add the science parts. Let's navigate to the science tab of the build menu, select the side mountable one, because of course we've got no place for the nose cone because we've got a parachute on top of the command pod. And there we are, we have now launched. Now we're going to immediately press the science tab, but where was it? We didn't have the atmospheric research in the research menu. And that's because, as you can see, it says atmospheric survey status, unlike in KSP1, a lot of the experiments take a significant amount of time to perform. In the case of the atmospheric survey, it requires a full two minutes. So um, we can just sit back, use the power of video editing to speed things up. And there we are, we have engine flame out. Now we're not going to stage just yet because of course the atmospheric survey equipment is attached to the booster. So we're going to leave it attached whilst we cruise on up to apoapsis. And then when we start descending, we actually need to sort out our staging. How's this for a pun? on the fly. Right now our next stage is the decoupler, but we want the next stage to be the parachute because we want to slow down our rate of descent as much as possible so that the atmospheric survey has a chance to complete. And then once it has, we can stage the decoupler and drop the booster and equipment because the scientific results are being stored in the command pod, not the experiment itself. And there we are, it's all completed. So let's press space for one more time and drop that lower stage. I guess we didn't really need to because we're, we're coming down pretty slowly. So we probably would have survived. It wouldn't have been destroyed on impact. And you noticed earlier, uh, we're coming down over the water. So a splashdown soft landing would have cushioned us even further. But I've put the decoupler on here anyway. So let's just go ahead and use it as we intended when we designed this. And here we are, splashed down successfully on Bill's probably his shortest flight so far, right? Let's recover the vessel and see what we earned. Confirm. There we are. Let's go uh, express escape and go straight to research and development, or I guess in my case, accidentally click mission control and then click research and development and see what we got. Uh, as you can see, we didn't really get any significant amount of science. So I guess this bonus launch was a bit of a waste of time, but hey, Hope you enjoyed it nonetheless. And it made up for the fact that we didn't get any science on the main flight for this video. So hopefully it was worth it in, in some way or another. And on that terrible disappointment, big thank you to my patrons who helped make all of this content possible, as well as the people who sign up to my YouTube membership scheme. I really, really do truly appreciate the support. And yeah, hope you guys are excited for the next mission, which is going to be uh, visiting the uh, strange... Mun Monument, which I've already visited several times in, in other videos, but now it's going to be like a mission, so I've run out of time.